collective love of plants, both indoors and out, has skyrocketed over the last number of years. And I think most would agree, gardening is good. It's good for us mentally, physically, spiritually, and cultivating a relationship with plants is overall a positive thing. Expressed interest in rarer and rarer species, which has become somewhat of a badge of honor, has also become more widespread, however. And that need or that want to have the rare or the unusual not only triggers anxiety in people who feel as if they are missing out on a plant of the moment, but also fuels a darker side of the plant industry, which is to say illegal extraction of plants from their habitats and the illegal trade and sale of plants. Though plant theft and plant smuggling is nothing new, according to many in the field, it has increased dramatically over the last few years, and particularly over the pandemic. So as plant lovers, plant buyers, and plant sellers, how can we be educated about the topic, be responsible in our decisions, ensure that we're not contributing to the illegal collection of plants, and ultimately be a positive force to reclaim that gardening is indeed good? I want to say that the first step is educating ourselves about the topic, but really I think the first step may be more introspective. Like asking why we may want a rarer plant, and what our responsibility is when sourcing, purchasing, or selling that plant. I know for myself I often like the challenge of growing something new, or I may get really interested in a specific genus or group of plants and want the experience and satisfaction of growing a range of them. But you have to ask yourself, to what end and at what cost? I share this in my book, How to Make a Plant Love You, but as a buyer of plants, they often come packaged or potted up and shipped to you, and that's it. We may have no other relationship or knowledge of where that plant came from. So becoming more educated about the fact that plants are being illegally removed from their habitats and sold for profit will give us the opportunity to make more responsible decisions and explore a healthier relationship not only to plants, but also the environments from which they come from. In light of the increased poaching of plants and the inherent lack of transparency for consumers when it comes to purchasing them, I wanted to do a video to help shed some light on the topic and perhaps share some solutions that are emerging along the way. I met Abby Meyer, the Executive Director of Botanic Gardens Conservation International back in February of 2020 at the Philly Flower Show and got to talking about plant conservation and the role buyers and sellers can play. Let's get into it, I suppose, because there has been increased news reports in the last probably year or two on plant smuggling. And it is it really increasing, I guess, to warrant all the reports that are finally coming out, or is it just finally getting its time in the public? It has increased exponentially with COVID-19 in particular, um, basically due to livelihoods and the suffering in low-income economy countries and the effects of the pandemic. But it has plant sales and illegal sales of poached plants have definitely increased in the last couple of years. So it's quite alarming very sad. What are some of the the main plant matter that we're seeing getting smuggled? Is it cactus and succulents? Are there other groups or, or genera that are being targeted? I mean, from my experience uh, and perspective, any of the main collectible plant types are really what what are being smuggled. And um, not ironically, most of those plant groups are among the most threatened plant groups that we know of today as well. Yeah. So those are orchids, aeroids, um, cactus and succulents, cycads, those types of plants that are highly desirable and collectible and not coincidentally, very portable. Uh, I spoke with some colleagues at Kirstenbosch Botanical Garden in South Africa this spring. And they were and are still just inundated with confiscated material. Mm -hmm. They have so much they don't know what to do with it. 
and they're quite concerned. Um, a lot of it is is all the you know collectible succulents from South Africa being confiscated in in large shipments going abroad. So it's quite concerning. I also spoke with Barbara Goach, who is the co-chair of the Cactus and Succulent Plant Specialist Group and program officer at the IUCN. Cacti and succulents are a particularly at-risk group, and that's something we discussed at length. Lately in South Africa, uh, it has been uh, devastating, like the amount of plants that have been illegally collected from, from the wild. It's really a shame to hear, considering that so, so many of those plants are probably endemic. You know, maybe you and I know this, but why are cacti and succulents, like as a, as a group, so targeted? Precisely, they're what, what people call or refer to as rarity, you know, and mm-hmm. in of rarity, you, in biology, we talk about where the species are found, so the area of distribution. Uh, it can be a rare species in terms of the area of distribution, which can be found in a very small area or and in terms of numbers. So it can mm-hmm. be that you only find it very, in very small small numbers. Yes, these are the two things that uh, collectors find very attractive, right? It's like something very unique that they want to possess. Yeah, and I'm, I'm even thinking of some uh, cacti and maybe some succulents as well, that if you're growing it from seed, it takes forever to get a large specimen, right? So... It sounds like some people are going right into the wild, taking the specimens that might have have been, you know, just growing there for for years, for decades, for you know, for for many decades. So it's as if like people want that instant gratification. Do you get a sense? I mean, this is probably going more into the psychology of things, but you know, obviously there's a psychology of like going for the rare and the unusual and the, the hard to get. But is there any kind of psychology coming into people where they're like, oh, I better take this because I'm going to be a better caretaker for this plant than, you know, or someone else who doesn't care about this plant is going to steal it? Or are these people who are like on, you know, the the black market and they're, uh, you know, they're, they have, they're just like confiscating these plants. They don't really care. And they're trying to ship them off to who knows where. Well, I think you find a little bit of everything, you know, like there's definitely the people that think that they are actually doing conservation through illegal collection Mm. because they, this plant will probably go extinct anyway if I don't take it and put it in my greenhouse. And you also, you know, which it's a, um, you know, a way of caring, but it's not the right one, right? (laughs) You know, you want these species to stay in the wild so that they can carry on their ecological uh, roles and also their evolution uh, path. Mm -hmm. And there's also the people that just um, collect them on scruples, on, uh, you know, without care, just because they, they, they see it as a, as a way of making money and they don't really care about the plants or, you know, the fact that, by collecting them, they're probably going to drive them to extinction. Right. Now, from the plants that have been intercepted, at least the ones that we, we've intercepted or have been reports of interception, do we know, we already know some of these plants are you know, probably coming from South Africa, as you mentioned, maybe some parts of the United States and Mexico where you have succulents and cacti, for instance. And of course, this is your, this is your lane that you're focusing on. But do we know where they're going? Do we know what markets they're going to? Do we know what countries they're being shipped to? Yeah, there's some, um, for example, in the in the case of the of the Chilean cactus that cacti that were confiscated in Italy, um, they some of them were gonna be sold in Europe, but most of them were gonna be sold in China, and uh, most of these plants are sold sought after in in Asian markets, which is something relatively new. You know, there was there the, we knew about the European market, but there's more and more Asian countries that are showing an interest in these plants. And for example, before um, it was more common to hear about plants from Mexico and the US, and the US being uh, confiscated, or you know, either in Mexico, the US, or in, in the hearing of these plants going to Thailand, going to uh, Japan, going to Korea, going to China. Yeah, and I actually gone to some places in Thailand, for instance, and I've seen you know collectors with really interesting cacti and succulents, and you begin to wonder where they're coming from. 
And there's a lot of also breeding and funky things that they're doing there as well, but they already have like some pre-existing large size plants. So now thinking back of some of those trips, I'm like, where did those come from? I think, you know, it's a a very interesting thing because I run a houseplant channel on YouTube and I have a lot of houseplant enthusiasts, a lot of like uh, plant collectors who are interested in the channel. And I'm wondering where does the average houseplant owner or houseplant enthusiast or plant collector come into this? How can people actually be a positive force and be informed about these things and to also understand that they're not actually purchasing something that could have been Uh, smuggled or pilfered or just completely illegal altogether? So I think, first of all, it's very important that people are aware that illegal trade exists in plants because this is a a problem that is um, not usually associated to plants, even extinction risks. You know, when you mention species, plant species being at risk of extinction, people go like, really? Is it a plant that is at risk of extinction? Uh, And that should ring the bell, right? Because as you mentioned earlier, the rare, slow growing cacti, if you're going to find an adult specimen, you know, to find one from propagation, it's quite difficult. Right. And then you could also refer to the IUCN red list. There's other lists out there to see if species are threatened, endangered or vulnerable, for instance, in the wild. It doesn't necessarily mean that only those are being smuggled or illegalized, but those are ones that you could, you know, at least like do some of your research in and, and, uh, and, and find out whether those are plants that are more vulnerable. So, you know, first of all, just like making people aware that extinction risk is, uh, it's uh, real for plants and that also illegal trade is a, a massive issue for, for many plant species is very important. Then if they are into collecting plants and rare plants, um, I think it's very important that they know the source the plants are coming from if they don't want to be doing anything illegal, right? In addition to getting to know your source, Abby shared that buying from sellers that have a legitimate nursery license can also help reduce risk that someone is buying something illegal. Getting to know your plant seller or nursery and even asking the hard questions. Do you have, and oftentimes they'll, they'll post on their websites, a nursery license as a step. And a nursery license um, is put in place at, at the state level through the Department of um, Food and Agriculture, typically. And those are put in place through um, through states to prevent the spread of invasive uh, plants and insects and other diseases. It's a really good step. It's required, really, to, mm-hmm. it's legally required to sell material, especially mm-hmm. selling out outside of um, the county where the grower lives and especially right. outside of the state. And then it gets a little more... Um, strict if you're selling internationally. But um, basically, uh, then by reporting that you're selling nursery material as a grower, uh, the authorities know about you, they can inspect you, and then you have the ability to apply as a grower for a phytosanitary certificate and all of the the other things that um, might help ensure best practices and demonstrate best practices. Do you think that would work for anybody who is trying to buy internationally, which I know has also increased um, quite dramatically over the last number of years? Yes. Uh, you can also ask, there There are nursery licenses uh, required across the world at varying um, administrative levels at the national level or their local um, state province or, or that, that level. Um, again, you can work around, growers can work around and and forge licenses or just say, yes, we have a license. Um, so, you know, there's that. Um, you can also ask, you know, about for CITES related material, cactus in particular, orchids, those are big ones. Um, and you can reference the CITES appendices to see which species and, and genera and plant families are listed. But for CITES material, you can ask, do you have a CITES permit to export this material? Again, they could say yes mm-hmm. and show you an image of something that isn't legitimate. 
but you can at least encourage the action, right? Through right. your through your relationship with your growers, your your plant producers. Really, it depends on the species or the plant type that, right. you're, that you're looking for. That um, it really, what is a sustainable practice for that plant? So, um, yeah, you can get to know your local grower and how they produce their material and where they get it from. I know more and more folks are actually actually importing plants in, and some some folks are importing plants in from Asia, for instance. And I would imagine that if you're like working with a legit nursery who's propagating their class uh, their own plants in the United States it's easier to have a conversation with them. But how does someone importing, and maybe they're importing it kind of in the right way. Maybe they're getting a phytosanitary certificate, they're getting their import papers, but how how do they really know? I mean, I'm assuming there's a lot of loopholes. There are a lot of them, uh, but I guess the best way of, of, you know, doing it is to search for an approved um, seller to ask um, the seller or other buyers, you know, what their experience is with those sellers and uh, to ask for certificates um, where necessary, right? Like if you're into plants, I would assume, you know, that at least you know where the plant naturally naturally grows, Mm -hmm. you know? uh, if uh, If you live in the US and you're sourcing a plant from Chile, you know, um, you should do your research and make sure that, um, you know, it has all the permits because yeah. all the are part of the CITES convention, right? So the plants need permit to be, permits to be traded. You know, people in the nursery trade who are now becoming aware of this issue or people who are just starting to sell, because there's a lot of people who like say, oh my gosh, I have a plant. I'm going to take cuttings now. I'm just going to sell it online. Um, you know, what what can they do to be more informed and to inform other people who might actually be purchasing from them? Absolutely. I think transparency is amazing. And I think the industry would do, we would do well to migrate to more transparency through the supply chain of, of plants. So if growers want to be more transparent and want to promote um, good practices, like uh, growing things in-house or the permitting process to import or buy plants from other growers. I would love to see more of that. Slowly, but surely more and more people are aware. It's more common for people to either ask or for the sellers to display where the plants are coming from, right? So, and in doubt, just really ask ask the the person selling them, you know, is this a plant that that it's coming from propagation from a nursery or is it a wild collected specimen? And I also want to bring up a topic that we had discussed at some point, um, you know, in the in the past. But uh, and I have actually noticed that somebody um, commented on one of my videos um, that uh, somebody who I was interviewing was was wild harvesting and people immediately think wild harvesting is plant smuggling or that you're not supposed to do that. And there are people who wild harvest for for food. You, if you're on private land, you could probably do just about anything. I should say, if you're on private land and you own that land, <laughs> you could do probably just about anything unless maybe you have endangered species. But on public land, you can apply to specific places. Like you could apply at a county or something of that nature, right? In order to be able to harvest um, appropriately. So there are proper ways of doing things as well. There are, and wild harvested products and food actually make up a really significant portion of people's income and livelihoods all over the world. And there are programs like Fair Wild Certification that focus on wild harvested products and the humans and the the social aspects surrounding that wild harvested, those wild harvested products. there aren't those types of programs in place for for ornamental plants, um, but wild harvested doesn't necessarily. You're right. Wild harvested doesn't necessarily equal bad or illegal or or poached material. Um, there are permits to wild collect for commercial purposes. Um, anywhere in the world (laughs) that exists. 
as, and in the U.S. as well. Um, so that would be really it would come down to what, like I said earlier, getting to know the intricacies, the threats surrounding the specific plant that you're interested in. You know, we've seen some kind of reports, but for somebody who's hearing about this the first time, where do, if something is confiscated, if somebody is caught and these plants are confiscated, what actually happens to them after that? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, and that's where I think part of my work with Botanic Gardens comes in directly here. Um, through, in the U.S., through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, they have a program to become for um, registration of botanic gardens and other sites, other organizations as plant rescue centers. Mm -hmm. When illegal material is confiscated, it then goes to these rescue centers. And most of those are botanic garden um, centers. Some of them are research labs or preserves where the the plant material will be grown and preserved through time and not shared for commercial purposes. So it comes along with some restrictions on how those plants can be used. Um, but at least, I always liken it to throwing the baby out with the bathwater. At least the plants survive somewhere and have some sort of public good as a, you know, as a, it's adding to our plant heritage in public living collections in these public botanic gardens or living museums um, for people to enjoy and learn about. So, yeah, I mean, does, do any of those ever get returned back to the wild? Um, sadly, I would say that's rare, but it does happen. Okay. Um, oftentimes it's impossible to document where that material was collected from. But in the case of really rare, material that they have well-documented remaining wild populations, they can be repatriated. Um, well, you had mentioned something just now about how, you know, some of those things can be returned to the botanic gardens and they can't be, they come with restrictions and they can't be used like commercially, but wouldn't that be something that could actually be a solution that if you do start to, if you find a nursery grower who actually does produce some of these rare or elite or exciting plants that people want um, that are that they're like smuggling or that are hard to get or whatever you want to call it, um, can't a nursery you know focus their attention on some of these desirable plants and you know maybe figure out how to do them in tissue culture or start to flood the market with them. And I mean, that's something that we talked about um, with, uh, you know, a gentleman in Thailand about cycads and that one of the rare species, they just started to cultivate it and then flood the market. <laughs> and it became like a just normal everyday species. Yes, that's been documented to um, occur with certain plants. Um, I, I'm familiar with another study uh, from Florida with, a, uh, I believe it was a palm species. It might have been a cycad species, though. Or Sorry. maybe an orchid. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, they flooded the market with seeds, and uh, they saw the market price decline through the years. Mm -hmm. And you, um, they were assuming or a, sort of putting a correlation on the market price to the potential of, or the drive to wild harvest those mm -hmm. species. Mm -hmm. So if the price goes down, it would less, it would put less pressure on, uh, or less, it would be less motivating for people to harvest it from the wild. One of the first plant shops who decided to take action and be a positive force in light of her awareness of the increased trend in plant smuggling was Liz Veda, owner of Bee Willow in Baltimore, Maryland. She dedicated a percentage of her sales to the IUCN's work, which led to the repatriation of Chilean cacti to their native environment after being illegally harvested and then confiscated in Italy. What she didn't realize was how little money can go a long way in plant repatriation and conservation. It's terrible. It's so sad. It's so sad to think that like a global collective love of plants could be driving um, varieties into extinction. I mean, it's just barbaric, honestly. Um, 
So, you know, for me, as a part of the horticultural industry, um, it really just made me stop and say, you know, what can we do? For me, as a business owner, what I could do um, to help make changes because, you know, with COVID, we saw such a crazy dramatic rise in love for houseplants, which is awesome. But with that dramatic rise has also come this desire for rare, hard to find plants. So it just kind of started to become like, okay, now this might actually become, be becoming a, a much bigger problem. So it's kind of how it all kicked off. And when you're supplying plants in your own plant shop, um, mm -hmm. Were you working with um, local nurseries? I mean, do you even specialize in kind of rare plants or what were you trying to do saying like, okay, I want my business to reflect my values, but maybe I know there's another layer to that where you're also uh, donating a, a percent of your uh, proceeds to the conservation of cacti and succulents. But take me through what you were going through with that as you were doing this deep dive during the pandemic. Yeah, well, that was definitely kind of like the first part of the puzzle, you know, am I part of the problem? Um, so thankfully, the plants that we sell are all cultivated, have been for quite a while. Um, the main nurseries we work with are out of Florida, and they've been in the business for decades and decades and decades. And I've had conversations with them about kind of what, how do rare plants play a role in kind of your you know side of the trade and for them it's like we don't really mess with that because for us it's so risky you know we want to put out plants that people can you know keep alive that are tried and, and tested through um a lot of people you know owning that plant so for me you know there's kind of this dual desire to you know be competitive in the sense of having harder to find plants because you see the demand for it, but at the same time, not pursuing those um, nurseries who I might not be able to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with. And most of them um, are not in the United States that I was kind of finding. Um, so that was kind of step one for me, was just like, as we brought in our suppliers, you know, making sure that we know where they're getting their plants from. So understanding like what are hybrids, what are not hybrids. Um, and for me, that's kind of where I'm, as we try to kind of move into acquiring plants that are lesser cultivated, my thought on that is why don't we just focus on hybrids? Because then there's just really a guarantee that this isn't something extracted from the natural world. And I think just promoting this idea of collecting plants that are, you know, existing naturally in the wild puts them at risk. So why put right. them at risk when there are a million different types of wonderful, awesome, exotic looking hybrids that we can, you know, generate ourselves, you know, within the trade to be able to use our platform, which for me is not only just showcasing plants, but really trying to use it for a positive environmental impact. Linking up with Jared and linking up with the IUCN CSSG, it just became this conversation where it was like, what can we do? Like, what are what are you guys lacking that maybe we can step in and help you with? When I started our fundraising efforts for them, we raised a thousand dollars in the first month. And that's kind of on average what we're raising for them, give or take. But with our first donation, they responded in an email to me like, would you be okay with us using this money to fund like part of the repatriation of stolen cacti back to Chile? And I was just dumbfounded because I couldn't believe that that thousand dollars was actually pivotal to the return of these cacti and that it was kind of the first of its um, kind in that sense. And it just dawned on me that small amounts of money can really make a difference because I think a lot of people view fundraising and donations as like oh well they need like a million dollars to really make a difference and it's like no a thousand dollars from like a small plant shop with five employees in Baltimore 
literally made global news because we gave them a thousand dollars generated through the sale of house plants. So to me, that was just such proof that if we could get everyone who loves house plants to regularly donate money or pressure, you know, their own plant shops to take accountability for their part within the trade, um, as well as just everyone who's benefiting from the craze of house plants. You know, there's a lot of people, especially across social media, um, you know, who are benefiting, even branding. You see plants everywhere. You know, plants have now become so popular, rightfully so. Um, but that, that to me was just so shocking how underfunded they were. I just, I couldn't believe that they didn't have access to that $1,000 they needed. When I was talking with IUCN, it was like a few hundred dollars that they needed. And I was like, oh my God, like you could probably find that in like pocket change on like just people walking in the street. You know, yeah. it's, it was, um, it was really unreal. And uh, for you to be able to take that initiative and then see the impact directly the impact of being able to um, repatriate, you know, some of those plants back into Chile just because they were basically languishing, right? Just to keep people in, in the loop if they're not familiar with the story, they were languishing in the, basically in an airport. When you think about like what this little bit of funding, that like the massive difference that it makes, you know, and, and I love the fact that they really want to give something back. You know, it's just like our business thrives because of these plants. We want to make sure that these plants carry on existing, right? And it makes me wonder, you know, like what, what if all the plant shops, the little plant shops did the same? Yeah, I, well, I think that's a, a call to action <laughs> right now, um, you know, and, and making this more of like plant lovers missions where this could actually be uh, useful and it's, it's a way to combat it. And in, in the case of Be Willow, they were, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was just a little bit of money that needed to be raised and a little bit, it was like, I think several thousand dollars that needed to be raised in order to get plants that were confiscated back into the wild and incorporated back into the wild. Otherwise they would just languish, you know, there and, and just all of that growth would, would die. And um, they were able to successfully raise that amount and the plants were able to uh, be incorporated back into, the, into their native habitat again, correct? Yeah, that's correct. A few hundred. Wow. Hundred dollars. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. It was a few hundred dollars that they needed to raise. That, yeah, we, we were <laughs> short we were short by a few hundred dollars. And Unbelievable. I Unbelievable. You know, it's just like Lise, you know, you won't believe me, but the plants were packed and there's more boxes than we anticipated. And we yeah. were short by nine hundred euros. Amazing. Oh, we amazing. Used, uh, donations for this purpose. And she was like, Yes, please yeah. go. But back to this whole um, kind of shock value I had with, okay, $1,000 was pivotal to returning these cacti. Asking people to donate small amounts, pooling that all together, being able to collect a large amount of money that way. That's kind of the angle I think we can go down yeah. as far as, um, you know, how people can feel as though, you know, this $20, this $5 can really make a difference. So doing um, consolidated fundraisers virtually, I think will be huge and can make a huge impact. But yeah, focusing on awareness raising, fundraising, to me, you know, there's just limitless ways we can achieve that. But I think having these conversations regularly, um, doing everything we can, you know, via our social media to just not let people forget, you know? So the 22nd of every month, which I've deemed our monthly Earth Day, we donate 15% of sales. So every single month, you know, I'm trying to use that as an opportunity to definitely make sure people are hearing that from us. Mm -hmm. um, I just, you know, we just formally um, got partnered with IUSAN in March. So I feel like we've kind of done done a lot in a short amount of time. So it's it's just the start, it's just the beginning. So inspired by Be Willow and the 1% for the Planet initiative, we have decided that 1% of our Google AdSense revenue on Plant One On Me will be earmarked back to plant conservation initiatives. So this is really a call to action to other plant content producers, plant shops, and plant sellers 
to do the same. Because Liz and I think that if plant lovers could come together, then we could raise awareness on issues like this, and we could also be a positive force for good.